Okay, we'll be dis uh, discussing chapter 16, Body Systems. <clears throat> this chapter is really quite problematic, if you ask me, because I mean, it should really be broken up into at least six, six different chapters. So we'll be discussing the homeostasis, thermoregulation, and osmoregulation, the digestive system, circulatory and respiratory system, endocrine system, musculoskeletal system, and nervous system. Um, there might be more details here than is needed for many of these systems in this lecture. So I might skip some of the slides, or at least you won't be responsible for memorizing all the detail as a non-biology major, but I'll do what I can. Okay, so let's talk about homeostasis. Homeostasis refers to the stable state inside the body of an animal. And organs constantly adjust to internal and external changes to maintain the steady state or, or homeostasis. So homeostatic conditions include levels of blood glucose, body temperature, water content, blood calcium levels, etc. And this requires maintenance of equilibrium around a set point, around a specific value. And internal and external changes, stimulus, will be detected by a receptor and the body will adjust the activities to reset the boundary to the set point. And typically this involves a feedback mechanism that senses the stimulus and the control center and the effector organ that causes uh, the appropriate change response. response. And the th thermal regulation and osmoregulations are two, two examples. So thermal regulation, there are two groups of animals, uh, endotherms, they have different body temperature compared to the environment. Ectotherms, they have the same body temperature as the environment. Ectotherms have behaviors to control their uh, temperature, such as borrowing, resting in the sun, hiding in the shade. Endotherms generate internal heat. They have more mitochondria than ectotherms. Ectotherms. Endotherms also have insulation like fur, fat, and feathers. Here's an ar arctic fox uh, using its fluffy tail as extra insulation. The mammals can produce heat by shivering. This is an involuntary muscle activity. And both endotherms and ectotherms use a circulatory system to maintain their temperature. So how does the temperature regulate? Uh, regulation of her. Vasodilation refers to the uh, blood vessels widening that brings more blood and heat to the surface, allowing more radiation and evaporation. Vasoconstriction, this is vessel narrowing that reduces the blood flow into the peripheral vessels, and that allows blood to concentrate into the core and the internal organs. And some have countercurrent heat exchange. That means the veins are next to the arteries, which warms the blood returning to the heart. And that prevents the heart from cooling too much. And this can be found in humans, dolphin, sharks, fish, bees, hummingbirds. And how it works is briefly shown up here. Warm blood goes that way, cold blood goes this way, but it's next to the warm blood. So it gets heated up. So temperature is regulated by the hypothalamus through vasodilation, vasoconstriction, shivering, and sweating. Uh, during an infection, germs produce what we call pyrogens, which is which causes hypothalamus to set a higher temperature set point. This is what a fever is, and this helps fight off the infection. So when temperature falls, vasoconstriction causes heat to be retained. When the temperature rises, vasodilation causes heat to be lost. And bacteria, uh, like I said, uh, your, your book repeats a lot of information. So, I mean, when I keep repeating the same thing, I'm just doing that because the book does it. <laughs> so endotoxin is an example of pyrogen that are released by bacteria that's been destroyed by leukocytes. And this will generate heat. 
So what must be occurring? If your body is generating heat, it needs to, it's trying, it's doing that because it needs to lose the heat. What breaks the fever? Sweating breaks the fever. And that diagram is shown here. Body temperature falls, blood vessels constrict, heat is retained, you return to normal body temperature. Your body temperature will rise, rises, then uh, vessels dilate, you sweat more, heat is lost to the environment, then you return to your normal body temperature. Similar thing occurs with osmoregulation. This maintains the salt and water or osmotic balance as we call it. And this occurs within, across the membrane within the body. So body fluids have water, electrolytes and non-electrolytes. Electrolytes dissociate into ions, non-electrolytes do not. Um, body has three main fluid compartments, blood plasma, interstitial fluid, that's between the cells, and intracellular fluid. <clears throat> to maintain the osmotic pressure, or osmotic balance, excuse me, excess water, electrolytes, and wastes are excreted by the kidney. If kidneys don't function well, the toxic wastes will accumulate in the cell. And osmotic pressure causes volumes of all three main fluid compartments to temporarily um, uh, change. And this has direct effect on blood pressure. That's why when you have uh, uh, problems with blood pressure, your doctor tells you to watch your uh, salt intake. This is why. Ex uh, <clears throat> first system, excretory system. Excretory system removes waste through the skin as sweat, the lungs as CO2, and through a urinary system as urine. Urinary system has the kidneys, ureter, and urinary bladder, and that's connected by urethra. And the kidneys are a pair of bean-shaped organs right below the liver, shown here. Uh, each contain each kidney contains more than a million nephrons, and it's these nephrons that are the filters. And the blood in the human body is filtered 60 times a day by a kidney. And there's, there are about uh, three liters of plasma in a human body. So that's kidney is filtering 180 liters a day. So blood enters the kidney through the renal artery from the aorta. Artery carries blood from heart to the organs. Vein does the opposite. So here's the renal artery going into the kidney. Once blood reaches the nephron tubule system, here's a cross section of a kidney here. Nephrons are shown here. This is the renal pyramid. These are renal pyramids. And inside the renal pyramid resides the nephron. And nephrons have glomerulus. And it's the glomerulus that filters out small solutes, ions, glucose, amino acids, vitamins, and waste from the blood. And glomerulus contains these tubules. Here's a proximal convoluted tubule. It's proximal because it's right next to glomerulus. And that leads into descending loop of Henle, then comes up in a ascending loop into the distal convoluted tubule. It's distal because it's far away from the glomerulus, and that drains into the collecting duct. So as, and that is the tubule. As the fluid is passed through the tubule, water, ions, and useful compounds are reabsorbed and leaving only the waste. And some of this reabsorption process requires ATP. And some of the waste will actually diffuse out of the tubule again. And then they have to be tu uh, taken up by tubule cells, which then actively secre secretes back into the tubule using ATP. And the waste they collected uh, leaves the kidney via uterer into the bladder, 
and bladder has the sensory nerves. And this is how you can detect when you had to go pee. And the people with kidney uh, diseases use hemodialysis machine. And it's this process that that machine uh, does for the patient. Okay, digestive system. Digestion begins with breakdown of food in the mouth and aided by the enzymes in the saliva. And the esophagus moves the food down into the stomach using peristalsis. It's a wavy motion. And the stomach is highly acidic. pH is about 1.5 to 2.5. This kills the germ, most germs, except some notable exceptions, and breaks down food tissues and activates the digestive enzymes. And digestion will continue in small intestine using bile and various other enzymes from small intestine and pancreas. And the nutrients are absorbed in the small intestine. And then waste is sent to the large intestine that removes the excess water. So in the oral cavity, digestion begins. Uh, food is broken into smaller pieces, mixes with saliva that contains lysozyme. This is an antibacterial enzyme because it breaks down protein. And then amylase, it converts the complex starches to disaccharides. And lipase, this breaks down the fats. And the bolus, Bolus is the processed food mass, and, enter, and that enters the esophagus located here. In the back of your uh, throat. And esophagus has a smooth muscle that undergo peristalsis. It's a unidirectional wavy motion. And it's, a, it's an involuntary reflex. Once you, once you start, you, can't, you cannot control it, except in a vomit reflex. And it also has gastroesophageal sphincter at the stomach end. And this is what acid reflux uh, happens when acid enters the esophagus through the sphincter. I'm not too keen on you. Uh, you can take a look at these diagrams if you want to. And then there's the stomach. Stomach secretes the highly acidic digestive juice, juices. Some It kills most germs. There's an E. coli strain called E. coli 0157H7. This arose out of feedlots, and this is acid resistant. And that's why this particular strain is so dangerous and causes a lot of uh, problems. Stomach also releases pepsin, which digests proteins, and it keeps churning the chyme. At this point, food is no longer bolus, but is it is a chyme. It's, this is mixed with gastric juice, food mixed with the gastric juice. And that aids in the further breakdown. And chyme then empties into small intestine in about anywhere from two to six hours after the meal. The stomach lining is not affected by the pepsin or, or the acid because it has mucus lining on it. And it's not affected by this protein enzyme because it's only activated by the acidity. Then chyme moves into the small intestine where the digestion of protein, fats, carbohydrates complete. And then highly folded structure, uh, folded surface with projection, villi, will start the absorptions. And each villus contain many microscopic microvilli to increase the surface area and, and increase the efficiency. It's over 19 feet long, first part, is called the duodenum, where chyme is mixed with pancreatic juice to, news, to neutralize the acidity. And pancreatic juice also contain, uh, contains enzymes to break down carbohydrates, proteins, and fats further. And the bile is made in the liver and stored in the gallbladder, enters the duodenum via bile duct. And this makes the fats accessible to water-soluble enzymes. 
and absorption occurs in the small intestine and undigested food enters the large intestine. Here's a duodenum seen here and different parts of the small intestine is listed here. And ileum is the last part of the small intestine that's joined to the large intestine. And the large intestine <clears throat> reabsorbs the water from in uh, undigested food material and processes the uh, waste material. It has three parts, the cecum, the colon, and the rectum. The cecum is located here. Colon is this part here. And rectum is the last part before the anus. <clears throat> and the colon is the location where your intestinal flora or gut microbiota resides. And this is, like we said in the microbe or microbe chapter, it's one of the most important thing that human body has. It, human body has about the same number of microorganisms as human cells. Remember that from microbe chapter. Uh, accessory organs, salivary glands, the liver, the pancreas, and the gallbladder, they all secrete uh, en uh, enzymes that break down food into nutrients. And the liver is the largest internal organ, and this helps digest fats, detoxifies blood, and processes uh, vitamin and make plasma proteins. It makes the bile that's stored in gallbladder, like I said, and the pancreas secretes the bicarbonate. This is what neutralizes the chyme because bicarbonate is basic and also uh, secretes other enzymes. So nutrition, briefly, organic molecules are needed for building the body from uh, Need for building the body must come from food for, for, for us. And the carb complex carbohydrates can be broken down into glucose for energy. Humans do not produce enzyme necessary to digest cellulose. That's why we use it as, we eat it as dietary fiber, or we supplement it as a dietary fiber for some people, many people. Excess sugar is converted to glycogen, which can be used in a prolonged exertion. Proteins in food are broken down into individual amino acids and then it is absorbed. Whole protein cannot be absorbed, not even polypeptide chains, oligopeptide chains. Only individual amino acids are absorbed. Fats add flavor and works as an energy reserve. They are required for obviously lipid membranes, fat soluble hormones, and they aid in absorption of fat soluble vitamins. Uh, Fat-soluble hormones, these are often made from cholesterol. So we say bad things about cholesterol a lot. We've seen that in a chapter two. But your body needs it. Your body requires it. Um, essential nutrients. These are the nutrients that body cannot produce. They include things like omega-3, alpha-linolytic, linoleic acid, and omega-6, linoleic acid vitamins, minerals, and nine of 20 amino acids are essential nutrients. Your body cannot make it, so you must obtain it through diet. So we'll get into respir respiratory system. You now, we breathe about 15 times a minute on average. This equates to about 900 breaths an hour or 21,600 breaths in a day. Uh, breathing is both voluntary and involuntary. Possible to regulate the breathing when you're speaking, like I am, or singing, or it can be involuntary because when you fall asleep, you don't consciously breathe, but your body does it for you. The respiratory center in the brain regulates the breathing level, breathing depending on the CO2 level in the blood. And it's the diaphragm descending that creates the negative pressure within the lung and around the lung, inflating the lung tissue. That's how your uh, air enters. Here's a diaphragm. We'll see this in the lab uh, using, the, using the bell jar model. 
Um, so the air enters the nasal cavity and it's warmed and humidified. And then air travels down the pharynx. Pharynx is shown here. And larynx underneath the pharynx into the trachea and then into the lung. And trachea splits into branching bronchi into the right and left lungs. And once, um, and bronchi split into smaller diameter bronchi until it, until it becomes less than one millimeter in diameter. Now these are called bronchioles. So bronchi here, prim primary bronchus here, it's splitting into smaller bronchi. And at the end of it, bronchioles, the final bronchioles are the respiratory bronchioles. And these are the ones with alveolar sac attached. Here's an alveolar sac shown that is innervated with all these veins and uh, uh, venules and arterioles or uh, capillaries, capillaries. Venules and arterioles will branch out into these uh, art, uh, capillary bed. And that's where the gas exchange occurs. So alveolar sac have about anywhere from 20, 20 to 30 alveoli in direct contact with the capillaries. And alveoli are shown here, these little sacs in direct contact with capillary bed. So total surface area for alveoli, if you add them all up, is about 100 square meters or half a tennis court. And these are also innervated by nerves that control contraction and relaxation of the smooth muscle cell in bronchi. Then you have breathed, breathed in oxygen and breathed out CO2. Now you have to circulate this. And our circulatory system is a closed loop network of vessels and heart. The blood is separate from body's other fluids. That's what that means. Uh, no, no, closed heart means, uh, no, closed loop means it's closed. It, your, your organs are not exposed to your blood directly. Um, heart is an asymmetric muscle consist consisting of two pumps, one pump to the lungs and another pump to the rest of the body. There are four chambers, right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. Right atrium receives the deoxygenated blood from the body and right ventricle is and right atrium and then, then sends the deoxygenated blood to the right ventricle via tricuspid valve. And then right ventricle pumps the blood to the lungs to reoxygenate it. Then left atrium, where's my, I lost my mind. Left atrium receives the oxygenated blood from the lungs. Then it sends that to left ventricle via bicuspid valve. And it's the left ventricle that sends the oxy oxygenated blood all over the body. And we call this double circulation and it's found in all mammals. So here are the lungs, here's the heart, here's the right atrium receiving the deoxygenated blood. And this deoxygenated blood will go into the right ventricle, which pumps it to the lungs. And from the lungs, blood will go into the left ventricle again, which moves into the left ventricle, I'm sorry, left atrium. Atri and from the left, <laughs> I can't speak, from the left ventricle, it sends it back to all over the body through the aorta system. And that's what forms the systemic circle or circuit rather. We could, um, 
and cardiac cycle you know, deals with coordinated contraction and relaxation of the heart by electrochemical signals. This is what causes the love dub, love dub heart sound. Contraction is just referred to as the systole, and the relaxation, relaxation is called diastole. Now, AV valve, atri atrioventricular valve, prevents the backflow into atria. And SL valve, or semi-lunar valve, prevents the backflow into the ventricles. And atrial diastole, or atrial relaxation, is when ventricular systole, or ventricular contraction, occurs. Ventricle pumps the blood into the lungs and the body. And AV valve closing is what makes the first lump sound. Then there's the atrial systole, which is same as the ventricular diastole. Atria, atria are contracting that pumps blood into the ventricle. And it's the semi-lunar valve closing that makes the second dub sound. So your heart goes lub dub, lub dub. And the electrical impulses in the heart can be measured using on the skin using electrodes. And that is read as the electrocardiogram. And you can actually record that. And people have uh, arrhythmia uh, issues with heart and can be measured on these uh, electrocardiograms. So blood vessels, and blood is carried by the arteries, which carry blood away from the heart, and veins, which carry blood towards the heart. And aorta and arteries near the heart have heavy but elastic wall to even out the pressure from beating heart. And arteries will become arterioles, which will turn into capillaries, into which single only a single red blood cell can move through. And the capillaries converge to then venules on the return, then minor veins and the major veins back to the heart. Veins are not thick walled, but they have valves to prevent, prevent backflows. So all that system is shown here. This is a little too, too detailed. I'm not gonna go over all of it. Here's, here, uh, here's the superior vena cava that brings deoxygenated blood from the upper part of your body. And here's the inferior vena cava that brings deoxygenated blood from the lower part of the heart. And they are going into the heart that way. And oxygenated blood comes out of aorta and goes out through the rest of the body. And here's the yeah no that's I think that's I think that's all I want to say about that. And here's the thoracic you know, aorta. So our arteries in red carry oxygenated blood. Veins in blue carry deoxygenated blood. Pulmonary arteries and veins. Uh, why am I making a point of that? because pulmonary arteries and veins are the ones that, uh, you know what, actually, never mind, not. don't worry about this. Okay, moving on to the endocrine system. The endocrine system produces the hormones that control and regulate many processes in the body. Uh, this coordinates the nervous system to control the functions of other organ systems. And the hormones also stimulate responses in cells that have receptors. And hormone receiving cells change and affect the functioning of the organ. Um, homeostasis requires the coordination of many of different systems and organs. And one mechanism of communication between these systems and organs is the use of hormones. Hormones are uh, secre secreted by endocrine system, made up from 
endocrine glands and cells. For instance, pancreas secretes ins insulin and glucagon that controls the glucose level. Insulin lowers glucose level. Glucagon raises glucose level. Adrenal gland also secretes epinephrine. That this, this is the fight or flight response. And the thyroid secretes the thyroid hormone. This controls the metabolic rate. And there's the endocrine system versus also exocrine system. Exocrine system secrete chemicals using ducts that lead outside the gland. For, ex for example, sweat gland is an exocrine system. Pancreas is both endocrine and exocrine. Endocrine functions for the insulin and glucagon, but digestive juices are connected to small intestine via ducts. Hormones bind cell surface or intracellular receptors and only affect the cells that express these receptors. And cells can also down or upregulate these receptors to increase or decrease the response to the hormones. And endocrine system, uh, endocrine glands that secrete the hormones into the surrounding interstitial, interstitial fluid. I really need to find a different picture for this. It's too fuzzy. Um, it's, huh. Well, here's the pituitary gland shown here. Um, I'll have a better version of the pictures in the uh, lecture slide file. You can take a look at that instead of just the video. Um, so yeah, hormones, they secrete hormones into interstitial fluid and then which then diffuses into blood. And all, all these hormone glands function exactly the same way. Pituitary, thyroid, parathyroid, adrenal gland, gonads, pineal, and pancreas, they all do this. And the pituitary is attached to the hypothalamus in the brain. And the posterior lobe of a pituitary gland releases oxytocin, an anti-diuretic uh, anti hormone. Anterior pituitary makes growth hormones and stimulates the growth. And prolactin also, which stimulates the production of milk. Uh, thyroid gland is in the neck and produces the hormone thyroxine and triiodothyronine, which increases the metabolic activity and energy use. It also releases calcitonin, which reduces calcium 2 plus level in the blood. This is, this is important for muscle functions. And adrenal gland on top of the kidney and consists of adrenal cortex and adrenal medulla. Adrenal cortex produces glucocorticoids, which maintains blood glucose levels, and ald aldosterone, which regulates water balance. Adrenal medulla is the one that produces epinephrine or norepinephrine. This is the fight or flight response, causes either increase or decrease uh, heart rate and changes blood glucose level. Pancreas has the islets of Langerhan that releases glucagon and insulin. And some organs have endoc endocrine activity as a secondary function. For instance, heart produces hormone atrial natriuretic peptide. Atrial natriuretic peptide. And that reduces the blood volume pressure. <clears throat> Kidneys produce erythropoietin, which <clears throat> affects blood uh, production. Oedipus tissues pr produce leptin, that's the uh, satiety signal in eating. Gonads obviously produce steroid hormones. Summary of the tables, you don't have to memorize any of this, just use it as a reference. Uh, Endocrine glands, pituitary, pituitary anterior, pituitary posterior, 
thyroid, parathyroid, adrenal, cortex, medulla, and pancreas. And here are the associated hormones and the effects. So regulation of hormone production, hormone production and release are primarily controlled by negative feedback process. As a matter of fact, negative feedback is one of the most important regu regulatory process in the human body. Anterior pituitary signals the thyroid to release, for example, to release uh, the thyroid hormone. And the increasing levels of these hormones give feedback back to the hypothalamus and the anterior pituitary to further uh, to inhibit further signaling to thyroid gland. Goiter, which is a di disease caused by iodine deficiency, results in inability of the thyroid gland to form T3 and T4. Those are the uh, hormones. Body typically attempts to compensate by producing greater amounts of uh, thyroid stimulating hormone, which reduces T3 and T4 further. Is this hypo or hyperthyroidism? Hormones are decreasing, so it's hypothyroidism. We'll move on to the musculoskeletal system. Uh, the musculoskeletal system provides support for the body and allows for movement. And the bones of skeleton protect the internal organs and support the weight of the body. Muscles contract and pull on the bones, allowing, allowing for movements like standing, walking, running, grasping things. Injur injury or disease of musculoskeletal system can be debilitating. And the most common musculoskeletal disease are caused by malnutrition. Other diseases like joint, like arthritis, can even impair mobility. Humans have 206 bones in the, in the, as an adult. They have five functions. Support, store minerals and lipids, protect the organ, and allow movements. The axial skeletons include the skull. Axial skeletons are shown in... Uh, blue here, skull, there are eight cranial uh, bones. Cranial cavity does not move in adults. And there are 14 facial bones that form the mouth, nose, and the eyes. And there are separate ossicles. These are three bones in each ear that transmit sound. And there is the hyoid bone. This is under the mandible, connected to the jaw and larynx and the tongue. This is for eating and breathing. Then there's the vertebra, which are the 24 bone and the sacrum and co cochix, which surround the spinal column. And they have holes where spinal nerves exit from. And it also has discs in between to absorb the shock. Um, yeah, and then there's the rib cage, sternum and the ribs, and thoracic vertebra, and coastal cartilage. Ribs are curved bones <clears throat> attached to the uh, vertebra and connects to the sternum using coastal cartilage. Coastal, I, I think we should talk about, these are the coastal cartilage. This is the sternum. It's not labeled, so I guess I have to explain it. And they're on both sides. <clears throat> and they're connected to the vertebra. These rib cages are. And now then uh, appendicular skeleton are in <clears throat> red. Appendicular appendages. And these are limb bones, upper and lower limbs. And it also includes the pectoral girdle, which is here. These are your hip bones. And it also includes clavicle and scapula. Scapula is the your uh, bone in the back of your uh, shoulder. Uh, pelvic girdle attaches to axial skeleton to the lower, <clears throat> lower limb. 
And this is what bears the weight of the body. And it has the socket joints and the strong ligaments. And femur, thigh bone, is the longest and the strongest and the heaviest bone in the body. And that's shown here. Joints and skeleton movement. Joints are where um, bones are meet. Bones meet and classified by the function and the structure. Structurally, there are fibrous, cartilaginous, and synovial joints. Fibrous joints are held by fibrous connective tissue without any cavity between the bones. These are things like joints in a skull, teeth in their sockets. Cartilaginous joints are joined by cartilage between vertebra, allowing for very little movement. And the synovial joints have joint cavity with synovial fluid filled in it. And this is what allows greater movements. So knees, elbow, shoulders, your fingers. And flexion is called the bending. This decreases the angle between the bones. Extension increases angle between the bones. Okay. And the rotation refers to a movement around its longitudinal axis. Uh, muscle, muscles, there are three types of muscle tissues. There are skeletal muscles, cardiac muscles, and smooth muscle. And each skeletal muscle is for the movement, cardiac for the respiration, and smooth muscle for the digestion. Skeletal muscle cells are striated and cylindrical, and they have multiple nuclei. And these are voluntary muscles. You control how, it, how they move. Smooth muscle cells are short, tapered at each end, and have only one nucleus each. These are found in respiratory and digest, digest, digestive tract and blood vessels. Some you have some voluntary control over, especially respiratory part, because you can effect a change to it. Uh, cardiac muscle cells are also cylindrical and striated, but shorter. And these are shown in here. Again, the lecture file will have better pictures. Um, the muscle fibers with cells in it have myofilaments, which are actin and myosin arranged in repeating sarcomeres that's shown here. This is what gives it, gives it that striated look, the sarcomeres. because they are arranged orderly and they repeat. And the contraction occurs when myosin and actin fibers slide past each other as myosin head binds the actin fiber, bends, disengages, and then repeats the process. So we can look at this uh, so, uh, cross bridge muscle contraction cycle is triggered by the calcium two plus. And <clears throat> once calcium two plus is bound to the actin active site, like here by the troponin, here's the calcium. Um, then it can form a cross bridge with the actin, the myosin can. That's so you know there's myosin is now attached attached to the actin fiber or actin yeah actin chain. Then the myosin head bends and AT, ADP and phosphates are released. And when new molecule of ATP attaches the myosin, then then myosin detaches. And then ATP hydrolyzes then myosin becomes, uh, returns the myosin to the cock position again, ready to bind the uh, active site on the actin that has calcium to bind to it. Uh, yeah. Now we'll discuss the uh, nervous system. 
Uh, nervous system is one of two systems that control over our organs. Endocrine is the other, remember? The nervous system control is much more specific and rapid than the endocrine, using both electrochemical and chemical signals. The nervous systems in animals wide vary in complexity, with, as you have seen here is kinderia, echinoderms, flatworms, there's a bee, there's an octopus, and there's us. Um, and vertebrates tend to have more complex specialized nervous system. So what are in all the uh, nervous systems? Well, nervous system has neurons and glial cells. Human brain has about 86 billion neurons. Compare that to 75 million in mouse or 300 million in octopus. Despite these numbers, they still control similar behaviors, reflexes, motions, and mating, and, and, and things. Uh, neurons can be highly specialized and with different sizes and shape for their functions. So here's a, a, here's a, a pyramidal cell. Here's a Purkinje cell that's found in cerebellum. Here's a olfactory neurons found in inside your nose. And the dendrites from Purkinje cell in cerebellum are connected as many as 200,000 other neurons. There's a Purkinje cell with many, many dendrites. These branching ends are dendrites. And the glial cells are the supporting cells. Uh, by guiding them to a destination during de development, they buffer ions and also provide the myelin sheath. They outnumber neurons by 10 times, 10x. But also most tumors stem from uh, glial cells. Uh, neurons have a unique structure for sending and receiving electrical signal allowing for communications. One, like I said, is the dendrite. These are the tree branch-like and extends from cell soma body or the soma. Soma is shown here, cell body is the soma. These are the dendrites. Some neurons have no dendrites, but most have at least one, but many most many. Axon is a tube-like, has axon terminals that synapse with the targets. That's, uh, I guess I call, uh, I, yeah. I called this uh, dendrites earlier, but I should have called it uh, axon terminals. This is the axon terminal for this neuron, which is interfacing with dendrite of the target neuron that confusing. And the uh, action potential reaches the synapse shown here between the exon terminals and the dendrites of target neuron. Then the neurotransmitters are released into dendrites of target, target neuron. And exons are covered in myelin sheath. And that's an insulator that prevents dissipation of the charge. And the myelin sheath is made by glial cells and have gaps uh, called nodes of Ranvier, where the signal is recharged. We'll look at that briefly. I don't know how much detail I'm going to go over, but we'll see. So here are the neurotransmitters being released, these green things. And this diffuses from the axon of one of the neurons, presynaptic neurons, we call it to the dendrite of second neuron, target neuron, or the postsynaptic neuron. And this is how the signal is relayed. And the neurotransmitters then bind to the receptors in the postsynaptic neuron. And this opens the ion channels that allows the sodium plus to enter into the dendrite cell. Why does it say so? Why does it say sodium? It should be calcium. Calcium enters the exon terminal. It's a typo. Uh, 
lipid bilayer is um, impermeable to ions, but it must use ion channels to transport them. And uh, if signal is large enough, the threshold of excitation is reached, which is negative 60 millivolts. And that causes the depolarization, uh, and which in turn causes positive feedback leading to more calcium and turning down the exile. Signal becomes self-propagating uh, potential then. So how does neurons communicate? Oh, where did my, oh, my. So uh, it uses what we call the voltage-gated ion channels and they change shape when voltage changes. And this allows the ion exchange. Um, uh, differences in total charge across membrane is called the membrane potential. And the neuron at rest has more negative charges, charge inside than the outside, which is about negative 70 millivolts. This is what this is called the resting potential. And that arises from differences in ion concentration inside and out. And here, sodium channel is shown closed at resting potential. Nerve impulse opens and sodium plus enters. And then inactive state at that point is irresponsible or irresponsive to new further nerve impulse. So depolarization involves sodium moving in, hyperpolarization involves potassium moving in, and then action potential just occurred. So This is a little too much detail. Let's just say action potentials are all or nothing, meaning it either action potential occurs because of threshold potential is reached or the neuron doesn't respond. So it must, here's the resting potential at negative 70 millivolts. You could stimulate it up to some point, but it's not going to cause uh, excitation unless you cross the threshold of excitation, which is here is shown as about negative 55. It's somewhere around there, negative 60 to negative 55. And once that e reaches, it's all or nothing. It just potassium channels open, sodium channels close, and the peak action potential occurs, which is about positive. 30 millivolts. And then uh, potassium continues to exit, causing me, potassium is positively charged. If potassium is continuing to exit out of the cell, then the positivity should decrease. That's what repolarization is. And Hyperpolarization is the refractory period where neuron cannot uh, fire again. Because hyperpolarization occurs because uh, potassium keeps uh, exiting. And once potassium channel closes, the uh, sodium and potassium uh, transporter restores uh, the neuron to the resting potential. I think that's all you have to really consider. And direction of the action potential is that way. And what's, and what's propagating is depolarized portion of the membrane. And it jumps from node of Ranvier to the next node of Ranvier. So, you can sort of think of it as a garden hose filled with marbles. And if you put in one marble at the end, then the other uh, one marble will pop out, a, pop out at the end of the garden hose. That's what's happening here. Um, this, is, uh, this is a little too much. Um, I'm not gonna go over this. Um, 
it's the same idea, just uh, linked to voltage changes as seen here. Here's a resting potential at about negative 70. And this shows you the ion concentrations outside and the ion concentrations inside. Note there are more potassium in it in here than out here and more sodium out here than in here. That's what sodium potassium channel regulate. But once it uh, once the uh, once the depolarization occurs, then all the uh, then the uh, sodium will move in. So that is trying to restore uh, restore the positive charge. But potassium continues to move out, like I said before, and that's what causes the hyperpolarization. But okay. um, so it's commonly thought that brain cells are postmitotic. For the most part, that's true. But in some regions of the brain, you can actually have neurogenesis or birth of new new neurons, and this continues on to into the adulthood. About a thousand new neurons develop in the hippocampus. And this is the structure that is responsible for learning and memory. And uh, so how do we how do we normally experimentally uh, identify newly divided cells? If neurons are developing, then they must be dividing. Neurogenesis is occurring, then we have new divided cells. Uh, scientists use what we call bromodeoxyuridin, and this gets uh, incorporate, incorporated into the DNA strand, and it glows red on the UV. And uh, this is a rat hippocampus treated with PRDU. Glowing red cells seen here shows that they have nascent or new DNA synthesis, or they have divided. So central nervous system, uh, let me tell me, uh, central nervous system is made up of brain and the spinal cord, and it's covered in three layers of coverings, or meninges. This is what happens when you get, this is what gets infected when you get meningitis. These are membranes, dura, dura mater, outermost, orach, orach, arachnoid mater, middle, Pia mater, or inner. And it's the pia mater that is in contact with cerebrospinal fluid, which cushions the uh, brain and absorbs shock. Here's a sagittal view, or the side view of the brain, showing different lobes of cerebral cortex. Um, not really. Well, here's the frontal lobe, obviously in the front. front. Parietal lobe is, yeah, I'm not, you know what? I'm not going to go over this. Uh, this I'm going to go over briefly. Okay, so thick uh, fired fiber bundle, corpus callosum. Body, corpus <clears throat> callosum, tough. This is what connects the two hemispheres of the brain. And the function of the two halves are more or less redundant. So in rare epilepsy cases, <clears throat> entire half of brain can be removed without having too many problems. <clears throat> in some epilepsy cases, only the corpus callosum is cut. We call this split brain. So if the uh, if patient has this surgery done, if the if an object is in the left visual field, the patient cannot name the object. They can pick it up. They just cannot identify. Why is that? It's because visual input crosses to right hemisphere from the left. Here's the left visual field. It crosses to the right. And but the speech center <clears throat> is found in the left hemisphere. So the brain doesn't get signal from this portion 
of the visual field. So some split patients can actually pick up the object with the left hand, and but they cannot verbally identify it. It's a really fascinating condition. Terrible, but you know. So the frontal lobe processes smells, just here. Controlled movement, cognitive functions like attention, speech, decision, personality, so on. Parietal lobe also processes speech, reading, pressure, pain, heat, cold, sense of orientation in the space. Occipital lobe, the back of your back of your brain, this controls vision, as we have seen pre on the previous slide. Temporal lobe, shown here, processes and interprets interprets sounds, and also con uh, contains hippocampus that processes memory formation. And one epilepsy patient had his hippocampus removed, and the patient was unable to form new memories, but person was able to remember the old facts and could even learn new motor tasks, which means the motor tax memory is not controlled by the hippocampus. Uh, basal ganglia is involved in moist, uh, movement, control, posture, and motivation. That's here. This basal ganglia is shown in blue here. Thalamus is shown in purple here, receives the sensory and motor inputs and feedback from the cortex. And this modulates the awareness of sensory and motor neurons, motor inputs. And hypothalamus shown, it's not shown here. Okay, so uh, where's my? So here's the thalamus and hypothalamus is here. They just didn't label it. And this controls the endocrine system by sending signals to pituitary gland, which is located here. It's right above the pituitary gland. And this controls the temperature and sleep cycle. And the limbic system is a connected uh, structure, including corpus callosum, basal ganglia, thalamus, amygdala. And this regulates emotion, fear, and motivation. Amygdala is important for sensation of fear and recognition of fearful faces. And cerebellum controls the balance, motion, learning new motor tasks. Uh, then there's the brain stem. Uh, the rest of the brain with spinal cord allows uh, controls breathing, swallowing, digestion, sleeping, walking, uh, sensory, motor, information integration. And the spinal cord is the thick bundle of nerve tissues that carry the information about the body to brain and from the brain to the body. And this is also located within the meninges and bones of the vertebral column, but it's connected to the body using the, these spinal uh, nerves. And the cross section looks like this. Axons make up the white area and the neurons and glial cell bodies make up this uh, uh, gray matter inside. And the dorsal, this is the dorsal or back. This is the ventral, your front. Dorsal neurons send sensory info from body to the brain. Ventral neurons carry motor info from brain to the body. And the spinal control, this cord controls quick unconscious motor reflexes using local synapses. Knee reflex is wonderful. And there are interneurons in spinal cord. Um, that is used to convey the knee reflex uh, has happened to, to the brain. 
uh, peripheral nervous system, PNS. PNS is the connection between the central nervous system and the body. They have the autonomic nervous system, which controls the body function without conscious, conscious control. That's why it's called autonomy. And then sensory somatic nervous system, uh, which transmits the sensory information to the CNS and then sends motor commands from CNS to the muscles. So autonomic nervous system is the relay between CNS and the organs without conscious control. And this has to continuously monitor the conditions of organs and make changes as needed. And signaling to the target tissue involves two synapses, preganglionic neuron synapsing to a neuron in the ganglionic synapse or the target organ. And there are two divisions of uh, autonomic nervous system, sympathetic and parasympathetic. They often oppose each other. So let's... So parasympathetic, uh, there's way too much detail. Okay, so parasympathetic, this is rest and digest. And this resets the organ functions after sympathetic nervous system is activated. Sympathetic service, or, or nervous system, uh, this is the fight or flight imm immediate response that animal makes. That's all you have to know about this. There are some more information here. This is the rest and digest versus fight or flight. The, yeah, yeah. So preganglionic neurons that mediate opposing effects of uh, parasympathetic and sympathetic neurons, or uh, nervous system, rather. Uh, again, parasympathetic causes pupils to di uh, dilate, bronchi to constrict, slows the heart rate, stimulates salivation, digestion, bile secretion. So rest and digest. Sympathetic system causes pupils and bronchi to dilate, increase heart rate, inhibit digestion, stimulate breakdown of glycogen, so, and secrete adrenaline, adrenaline and noradrenaline. So, fight or flight. Um, Peripheral nervous system also include the sensory somatic nervous system. And these deal with, these contain cranial and spinal nerves. And they both uh, possess sensory as well as motor neurons. Okay. And the cranial nerves are the uh, sensory, uh, cranial nerves receives the sensory input and control motor output for the head and the neck. That's all I'm going to say about this. Okay, and that sensory neurons send signals to signals from skin, muscle, organs to CNS. Motor neurons send signals about motion from CNS to the muscles. Okay. You know what? We'll stop it there. <laughs>